Well, greetings everybody. Welcome to our King's Channel. If you haven't met me before, my name is Al Yanai. I am the family of Yahweh kind of guy. In fact, I hope we're all the apple of our King's eye. And what I want to talk about today here is something that Amadeus had brought up. However, he had brought it up two days ago. And as you can see, I already had attempted what he had wanted. This is part one of the Lazarus video that I was wanting to do. I first start saying that I wanted to bring it out, hopefully less than 30 minutes. And it ends up the first part was 47 minutes, 19 seconds long. The second part was an hour and 15 minutes, 26 seconds long. Third part was an hour and nine minutes and four seconds long. And the last one here was uh, for 43 minutes and 40 seconds long. And then of course, if I was to go with that I would have to edit it that's all totally unedited that was just done here on the last Sabbath and I tell you you know the information that was brought out was really remarkable you could take a look all up here at the top all these different tabs for all the scriptures here and during that I used most every one of them because well let's read what Amadeus had wrote he said Abraham's bosom amigo was found in Luke 16 verse 22 and of course that's what we're going to focus on here shortly but I'd like to finish up with the rest of this comment I'm a further saying Abraham's bosom incorporates the covenant that Yahweh made back in Genesis amigo yes I I do understand that it's also the covenant here that it speaks of in Galatians chapter 4 down here in verse 24 it says which things are symbolic for these are the two covenants the one from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage which is Hagar for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children and that's talking about the earthly Jerusalem or Jerusalem as it is verse 26 but the Jerusalem above is free which is the mother of us all and that's speaking of father Yahweh's kingdom in fact when the kingdom returns and it sits on the earth it's referred to as new Jerusalem or new Jerusalem and that's why our father can name any place on earth that he so chooses as Jerusalem or Jerusalem and in Mount Zion as well which you've seen in scriptures a lot of times, I'm sure, if you've read them. But yes, there is this covenant, and the covenant of Isaac, which was from Abraham, as it shows here in verse 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, our children of promise. But anyway, we don't want to get too far caught off in that, but indeed but the thing is Alma you know if you knew this and you knew all if you knew all the scriptures by heart and you could just start from Genesis 1 verse 1 and just quote the whole book all the way to Revelation chapter 22 the very last verse it does not mean you're going to acquire salvation my friend that's that's not the point of the scriptures I know I used to have a photographic memory before I bashed my head on the floor and I had several different versions all memorized by heart you, you could have started speaking of any verse and I would have finished it for you and told you what chapter and book it was I don't know if you ever seen the movie powder I mean I wasn't as great as that guy was but I did have quite an ability and it tormented me because uh, you know these photographic memories it was near photographic memory but everything is always right there before my mind and I was tormented with most of the things that I knew so when it was taken like the second or third time I was relieved so now I just thank my king and allow him to guide me I don't even try to memorize these things again but I'm a unless you can get out of the scriptures if you knew them all by heart and this goes for everybody out there if you're not keeping the give or take 613 laws that apply to you and I know people reject those and they say oh no we don't have to keep those we just got to keep the Ten Commandments well great if you keep the Ten Commandments then you are keeping the give or take 613 laws that apply to you you can't get around it and that's the whole 
thing behind the scriptures. That's all salvation is. And if you can't understand that, you can't see it, it's just not your time this time. And hopefully, and I'm not saying this to you alone, I'm, I'm saying it to everybody who has a problem believing and keeping the every living word. Trying to say it away or do it away or abolish it or fulfill it or whatever fancy words one wants to put on it. The law has never been done away with. Not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law till all things have been fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away before one little law is done away with. No, eating pork is not righteous. It's the doctrines of the devils and the demons. Anyway, here we are a little further in the comments as a little further biblical help for you here, amigo. Romans 3.25, NASB, whom G.O.D. displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in Yahweh's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed go unpunished. Yes, indeed, you know, when we ask forgiveness, because none of us ever knew Messiah until these last days, from the year 325 A.D. all the way up till these last days, when my 143,999 other brothers out there were called out as well, we had a lot of sins under our belt, I'll tell you what. And that's how the 144,000 are virgins, because after we realized our sins, we repented. That's how we became dead to sin, and there's others that think that they become dead to sin just because they say it. They'll, they'll have a ham sandwich in one hand, a chunk of catfish in the other, talking about how they're dead to sin while they're munching down. Well, there's a lot of people out there dance with snakes, too, you know. They're protected from the poison. And yet preachers are dying all the time because the snakes don't agree with what they say or teach. But, Amma, you don't understand this word, propitiation, there. Because if you really read the scriptures, my friend, you'll see here in 1 Yachanan 2, verse 2. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins. There it goes again right there, see? He's the propitiation. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't like saying that word. For our sins. But look down here the next verse, my friend. Amigo. Now by this we know we know him. Who? The fella that's doing the propo the pro the P R O P I T I A T I O N for our sins. That man right there that did that for us, it says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of Yahweh, the laws and commandments of Father Yahweh, just like it said in 2nd Yachanan here, verse 6, because it's only one chapter, and it states, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. Anyway, let's further up here, and you mentioned here, you said, notice the last verse, and then you will understand why the deified Christos preached in Hades. 1 Kepha 3.18 through 20. So here 1 Kepha 3.18 says, For Yahshua also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to Yahweh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, or by the spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once Father Yahweh long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through the water. Now, these spirits that were in prison, my friend, please read the book of Enoch. That's where this guy, Kepha, the disciple is coming up with this information. This isn't Hades. That's not where the watchers were bound and stuck, you know. But that's where, these are the ones, the watchers, my king, went to preach to, okay? Who were formerly disobedient. This is not human souls, okay? There's no human soul 
They had left a human temple that our king went to speak to. It, it don't take place. There is no heaven for mankind. As far as the kingdom where our king went, my king went to sit on his father's throne, ain't no other human being gone there after they died. There's no one going to the kingdom of heaven when they die. It's all a lie, and I've showed it many times before. But as far as those spirits, my friend, that are in the prison, it's speaking of the watcher. And then Amma says, I hope this helps you, amigo. Okay, yes, I guess it, uh, it helps me that you commented, my friend. But please understand, the scriptures are real simple. If you really put your mind to keeping and living by the every living word, you can start understanding what you're writing there, my friend. So anyway, I really want to be able to bring this out in as short a time as possible. I'm going to be asking y'all to start reading to understand what's in Luke 16. You really truly need to start back with Luke 14 verse 1 and read all the way through to the end of Luke 16 to really understand. But I'll give you the synopsis. And I, like I said, I went through so many scriptures to show this. But who is it that our Messiah is speaking to in Luke 16? It starts here in Luke 14, 1. It says, Now it occurred, as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. So this is a boss over the teachers of Israel, the Pharisees. Our king, my king, went into this man's house, the ruler's house, over Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath. And it shows that they watched him closely. Now, please understand, it also had other people there invited. There was a fellow here that had dropsy, and Yahshua answered, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees. So there's a bunch of people there already eating the meal. And my king takes that as a avenue, an opportunity to bring forth truth so he starts bringing parable after parable, but then they finish eating and he ends up leaving, you know, but I'm thinking that after the parable here in Luke 14, 24, for I say to you that none of them men who were invited shall taste my supper. Okay, and of course everybody knows this is about the wedding supper it's speaking of, but I take it that he had left after that parable because it shows here in verse 25 of 14 it says now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them and then he speaks things talks about how salt is great but if the salt has lost its flavor or its saltiness how shall it be seasoned it's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill but men throw it out who has ears let him hear the next chapter shows 15 verse 1 now then when messiah had finished eating with the chief of the pharisee and you know the pharisees always dressed to the hill long seat seats and everything else luke 15 1 but also with the multitude of shows then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him so now we speak into these ones and he's being bold i mean read these parables he gets down talking about the woman that lost the coin he gets talking about the prodigal son which most people don't understand that either it's basically speaking about a young man who thought he knew everything and he takes off on his own he comes to find out he knew nothing and when he realized that he asked forgiveness and he got it okay that's the moral of the story and for those that have a problem with those that repent, you shouldn't want people to perish, you know, because you're cursing yourself. Luke 15, 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead. Yes, Messiah also spoke about to a fellow. There was a fellow who went after Yahshua and he said, hey, he says, I, I want to follow you, but let me go home and bury my father first. And my king says, hey, let the dead bury the dead. Show us right here. For your brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. 
So then we get into chapter 16, and I'll tell you here in chapter 16, verse 1, it talks about there was a certain rich man who had a steward. Now, please again, take a look at chapter 14, first verse, where Messiah is at the house of the chief, one of the chiefs, over the Pharisees. There's a certain rich man who had a steward, but in this parable, our king is also putting an emphasis on this rich man being Satan the devil, okay? It probably could have been a rich female, because if you read down here, there isn't any righteous individual that knowing his stewardship was taken away, that he calls those that owe his ruler things, and he tells them, hey, Let's rip off the guy that's kicking me out of my job. And then the one that was to kick him out of his job, as it shows here in verse 8 of Luke 16, it says, So the master, the ruler, Satan, commended, praised the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Yes, Satan does that. Satan loves to praise those who do shrewdly. It says, for the sons of this world, those of Satan the devil, are more shrewd in their generation than the children of Yahweh. Yes, because we don't lie and we don't deceive. And then Satan further saying here and says, and I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Yes, Gehenna is an everlasting home. It was made for Satan and her minions, and everyone that will follow Satan is going to follow her right into Gehenna. Right now, human beings, none of them except for Messiah, ever had been given an immortal soul at this time. Nobody else that was human has acquired an immortal soul. When you die, you die. Until the resurrection, you're dead. You're sleeping. That's it. That's all there is to it. But you can see here Satan's praising those who go after the unrighteous mammon. It's our king speaking it, but he's making a parable of it, trying to let these ridiculous rulers over the Pharisees that are teaching the Talmud and traditions of men and everything, and they're making great money off it, and when they're out there, everyone wants to be around them, touchy-feely, whatever, hoping if they touch them, they'll get some salvation, you know, get a Pope on a rope soap, you know, and shower every day. The more you shower, the closer to heaven you get. But anyway, we want to get down here and keep everything in mind again. But please notice here in verse 17 of chapter 16. Messiah says, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Does that sound familiar? Here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says, Do not think, don't contemplate, don't consider that I came to destroy or do away with or abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to do away with and abolish and fulfill the law. That's how Christian Canaanites read it. My Messiah said, I did not come to destroy, but to perform, to show you how to keep it, fulfill it, just as we were told that we are to fulfill it in the royal law. And our Messiah even said, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And there's some um, pork chop eating guys out there saying, well, well, you know, even if eating pork is bad, well, you know, being the least in the kingdom's great, because King David said he'd, he'd want to be a foot washer or anything in the kingdom, making it's just great. Well, what is talking here, right there, for one that breaks, the least of the commandments and teaches men to do so, our Messiah also said. If you take one of the least of these children, you cause them any harm, you might as well get you a tailor to measure yourself out, a rope to hang your millstone around your neck with while you get dumped in the deepest parts of the ocean. And that's how you make one of the least of the children stumble, is when you break a commandment and convince them it's okay. 
You're going to be ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous in that day. Next verse says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness, your keeping of the laws and commandments, as it says in Deuteronomy 6 verse 25, then it will be righteousness for me and you, if we are careful to observe all these commandments before Yahweh our Father, as he has commanded us. So anyway, read that parable, Luke 16, 17. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Keep the give or take, 613 laws, it applies to you. Then our Messiah at the very last verse in that parable, he says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits it. He's teaching the law. Cannot the Christian Canaanite see he's teaching the law? So anyway, let's get to the rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Please correlate all this. This is all going on the very same evening, I suppose it would be at this time. From the time my king went to Sabbath meal with a chief of the Pharisee. He's bringing out a few parables, speaking of the chief priest, speaking of the authorities over the children of Israel. And this here certain rich man was either a Pharisee, or a priest, or a chief of the Pharisees, which made him all sad, you see. But anyways, there's this rich man Clothed in purple, purple was something for royalty because it was very expensive. They had these snails from the ocean that only had a little teeny bit, and they have these mounds, millions and millions of them, that they destroyed just for this little teeny bit of purple that was in them. That's what the fellow was clothed in, was in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. He had no, he had no problem with buying his bread. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Hopefully you've been reading the scriptures enough that your mind is immediately gone to that Canaanite woman that my king called a dog. And she says, yes, but as dogs lick up the crumbs that fall from the children's table, we hear the words and we obey. That's what Lazarus here was trying to do, was listen in while he was at the gate of this rich man, this here Pharisee or Sadducee or chief of the Pharisees or priest or whoever was supposed to be teaching the truth. But apparently he was found not too worthy of doing it. it says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores again. The Canaanite woman was considered a dog. You can think of the other parable, too, of the Samaritan, where the one fella got robbed. He's laying half dead in the street, people walking by him. Maybe it was that certain priest or Pharisee that walked by him that's the certain rich man in this parable. Our king uses these parables to show you things that unless I show you here, the Christian Canaanite just can't see. So it was that the beggar died. It was carried by holy Malachim to Abraham's bosom. Now this, I suppose, is what Amma wanted to point out in the comment section there, where it says, Abraham's bosom incorporates the covenant that Yahweh made back in Genesis Amigo. And if you want to put that in there, that's perfectly fine, but it, it's not what the parable is about. And it says, the rich man also died and was buried and being in torments in Hades. And of course our king is speaking this parable. He's not saying that Abraham's actually in heaven right now and Lazarus is there on his bosom. It's not that, this is a parable. It's one of the only things that Christians wanna believe is factual when it actually isn't and has nothing to do with heaven. In fact, I'll show you right up here. Take a look at my arrow. There's these three dot dealies. I'll go down here, we'll look at find, and it shows heaven here is only one time in Luke 16. And it's not in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it's verse 17. It says, 
and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. So you can see this isn't speaking of anyone going to heaven, but it's to learn a lesson that I've never seen before a Christian Canaanite ever grasping when they read this. It's not in them because they do away with the law and they don't know my king so they can't understand what it is that's being spoken of, but please bear with me, I'll show you. Here in verse 23 again, And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I mean, what kind of guy would that be, you know, to be like tormented so bad that he'd want somebody to go ahead and dip their finger in water to touch the, why not just give him a cup of water? My king wants you to think about what this water is. It's the water of life that Lazarus allegedly acquired in the parable. That's why he's in Abraham's bosom there, because he lived by the every living word that he understood. And he thirsted for more truth at the gates of the priest while they were alive, and the priest never paid him no mind. The Pharisee, whoever it was. But this finger, he just wanted a little refresher on the tongue because he's tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your righteous things. And likewise, which is horrible, Lazarus evil things. So likewise, all the righteous things that the Pharisee got or the priest got there in a like manner with the wicked and evil things is what Lazarus lived his life putting up with. And it says, but now he is comforted and you are tormented, which is going to result in the end after the resurrections. There are certain ones that will end up in Gehenna, but not until then. This is a parable, please. Remember, this is a parable. Verse 26, And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. And certainly, when I finish this parable, if you cannot understand it, though it's going to be revealed and showed in its simplicity, what it's actually speaking of that the Christian Canaanites cannot see. Now, if I speak all these things and you still can't see it, it's because of this gulf. You are of the covenant of Hagar, Mount Sinai, the covenant from below, where these words are for those that are of Isaac's promise in the covenant from above in New Jerusalem. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father Abraham, that you would send him, send Lazarus to my father's house. Why? For I have five brothers that they may, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So there you go, that he may what? Testify. Up here, he wanted Lazarus to testify. He wanted Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and refresh because the guy went stagnant. His love turned cold. And your love must be better than his or you're not going to make it in the kingdom as we see in Matthew chapter 5 that your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Pope. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to do that, you know, that shouldn't even be the, in the equation. So here you are in verse 28, For I have five brothers, that Lazarus may testify to them, that he may dip his finger in the water and refresh their tongues, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, now please pay attention to this, my friends, my Christian Canaanite buddies. Abraham said to them, they have Moshe and the prophets, let them hear them. That's what Father Abraham tells this dead guy 
they got Moses and the prophets, let them hear him. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. You know, and every Christian Canaanite out there is thinking that this dead guy is telling Father Abraham that if Lazarus goes back from the dead to his brethren, that they'll certainly repent. Well, it's not talking to Lazarus here. My king is bringing forth this parable telling these people in advance that when he lays down his life and he takes it back up again, and he returns from the dead to sit on my father's throne, on his own throne, on my father's throne, all those who call themselves Jews and such, the Hebrews, for the most part, except for the 144,000 in these last days, deny Messiah. And they don't read the New Testament anyway. But the fellow says, no, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And what did Father Abraham say? He says, but he said to him, if they do not hear Moshe and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Please tell me that what's popping into your minds right now, my friends, if you do read the scriptures and you put your trust in the scriptures, what does Luke 16, 31 also sound like? But he said to him, the dead priest or Pharisee, if they do not hear Moshe and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded Though Yahshua comes back from the dead, they're not going to believe. Because why? Messiah told them while he was living. He said here in Yachin Honor John 5.39, he says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Well, how do you come to the Messiah? You come to the Messiah by giving up your sins and asking forgiveness for breaking any of the laws or commandments or the commandments in the law. Our Messiah told these people, he says, but I know you that you do not have the laws and commandments of Yahweh in you. Verse 42. Then get down to verse 45. He says, do not think I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you Moses, Moshe, in whom you trust. The guy you try to quote all the time and then you do against. Verse 46, my king saying, For if you believed Moshe, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. And then he says, But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Quickly again. Luke 16, 31. Our king's making a parable, making it sound like Father Abraham's telling this dead guy this. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moshe and the prophets. I mean, can't you see my king taught these things? Why do you Christian Canaanites throw it out the window with the bathwater? When our king says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says, you don't even know them if you don't. He says, you're a liar. And that's why you can't see this if you still can't see this. I pray you can, though. But he said to him, If they do not hear and obey Moshe and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though Yahshua rose from the dead. That's what this entire story of Lazarus, starting at Luke 16, verse 19, is about. The Pharisee and the little child who wanted to enter into the kingdom. Though he was older, he entered in as a little child. So please understand these things. If you got any questions, please put them down here in the comments. But I got to tell you honestly, I don't know how you cannot see this if you cannot see this. And please again go from chapter 14 and read it through. Apply what you know now. This is the lesson my king wanted them to see. And it was all spoken on the same day after my king went in and dined 
with one of the chiefs of the Pharisees. And with that, I love y'all. Bye.